in all those things, little Johnny has dealt with pain. Little Johnny has dealt with achievement. He's dealt with victory. He's dealt with defeat. And he's dealt with grief by ice cream. So These little ice things, cream becomes the emotional band-aid. Bingo. Exercise is a better metabolizer of adrenaline. Clinically, what I've seen with patients over the years is that sometimes that traumatic loss is so paralyzing, people can't even exercise. Yeah. They can't even breathe. They have so much anxiety or so much dread that minute by minute, they can't cope. That jurisdiction of the sheriff is really the most powerful guard and protector of the rights of the people than any other institution our founders created here. Understanding the relationship between food and emotion is a loaded gun. Oh, and it pulls the trigger many times too and destroys a lot of lives. Like, for example, we find people doing what's called comfort eating. And we all know what that is. It's when you are looking for food to provide comfort for some wound or hurt that you're going through. And typically the foods we gravitate to are the worst kind of foods that create inflammation. They will cause you to gain weight. And they'll cause you to even be more sick and more depressed and more wounded. So it never solves the problem. So we've got to get away from using food as a comfort. I just think that's the, the key thing with, within what we need to talk about. We've talked about this little story with little Johnny for a long, long, oh, long yeah. time. And it is all around events and emotion. Can you talk about that little story? Yeah, little Johnny, he seems to get the brunt of all the jokes these days, doesn't he? You know, little Johnny. Little Johnny. Poor little guy. He let's 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 make little Johnny in this case 4 years old. So little Johnny gets on his bicycle and he's learning how to ride a bike, you know, he's got his training wheels off and he falls down one day and gets this boo-boo on his knee. Boo-boo for those of you that don't know what that is, that would be like significant road rash. Mom comes along and says, "Oh, little Johnny, let me give that boo-boo a little kiss and let's go get you an ice cream cuz that's going to make you feel better." Of course, little Johnny goes and gets the ice cream, he feels a little bit better. Well, little Johnny gets in school eventually. He gets to first grade, and he starts making good grades and brings home a report card, and that thing says an A on it. And little Johnny is so happy, they go celebrate with, you got it, an ice cream cone. Well, little Johnny eventually starts playing sports, and they have a great, big, amazing victory one day, and they're so happy. It's time to go celebrate with some ice, ice cream. cream. You get it, right? Well, little Johnny's sports team, they go from the victory to defeat, just like the wide world of sports used to talk about. Well, they have to go console themselves with an ice cream. And then little Johnny gets to third grade and he finally has somebody that's very important to him die, say his grandma or grandpa dies. And they have to go get some of that grief taken care of by getting him an ice cream because that's what grandma used to do. In all those things, little Johnny has dealt with pain Little Johnny has dealt with achievement, he's dealt with victory, he's dealt with defeat, and he's dealt with grief by ice cream. So These little ice things, cream becomes the emotional band-aid. Bingo. And little Johnny never knows how to deal with that. And so when little Johnny gets to be a grown man, all we are is products in adults. We're products of our childhood. And all those memories are sort of cooked into and baked into and tattooed into our hypothalamus in a sense where in our inner brain we have that memory that says i know why i felt better and what made me feel better so those triggers appear again we've got to relearn those triggers and i'm not saying that ice cream is bad i didn't say that at all but to use food as a band-aid in all those emotional things translates children into addictive eaters when they have problems as adults and emotional eating the satisfaction from emotional eating will never be satisfied, no. which is completely different than true physiological hunger or hunger pangs. 
If yeah. you're truly physically hungry and you eat nutritious food, you will satisfy those the hunger pangs. But yeah. the emotional need will not be satisfied just with emotional eating. No, it will actually make you more hungry. It's funny, you know, um, there's a, a term that is used a lot of times that we kind of consider it overeating. It's called gluttony. But gluttony, by definition, is the insatiable desire for something that will never bring about satisfaction. Think about that for a moment. The insatiable desire for something that will never bring about satisfaction. That's a huge deal. And that could be anything. I mean, you could become addicted to anything like even drugs, but you can become so addicted to food in those times of hurt and wound. And boy, in our world today, people hurt and they have wounds and they have pains and they have traumas and dramas and uncertainties. And a lot of people, I mean, even with the past, uh, remember the pandemic we had and went through a couple years ago, you know, there was the COVID-19 or whatever people were saying that was weight gained. Why was that? COVID 19, 20, 40, before <laughs> COVID it was all 40, yeah, whatever that was. Yeah. But it became something that became a problem. And it caused people to become more and more depressed. And we saw, you know, suicides go up and isolation builds depression, which depression and then can build to overeating, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an incredibly strong tie and link to emotions and eating, but we need to sort of diminish or dismiss or even cut that link in half because emotions are great. Eating is great. We have to have both and we should be able to uh, do both effectively. But when they're connected like that in an unhealthy way, it just sort of multiplies unhealthiness. What I found, one of the tricks that I found or one of the tools that I found has been very helpful is to have a better relationship with food. Mm. I mean, we have to eat and we want it to be pleasurable while we're eating. We spend a lot of time with family and friends eating. When we sit down to a plate of food, mm -hmm. it is good to have a conversation with what we're doing. Do I need this? If the answer is yes, do I need this right now? If the answer is yes, ask the question why. Oftentimes we discover that we're tired. We need to be sleeping instead. We're bored and we're going to food as a habit. We are, it's, it, we're chewing on something hmm. emotionally. So we're going to food as comfort. So if we can identify the reason that we're actually going to food as a comfort or we can change the relationship that we have it and probably save ourselves a lot of physical stressors and discomfort. Oh my gosh. A lot of people today, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to call it, talk Christian ease because it freaks people out. But the bottom line is, you know, people that are Christian out there know they have the Holy Spirit within them. And that's, he is known as the comforter. So if you think about this, why are we trusting in this piece of food over here that's not got any nutrients in it over the real comforter? It kind of makes you think about that. But honestly, if you're a parent out there and you're, we talked about with little Johnny rings a bell with your child, uh, begin to make some changes for little Johnny's good. And if you're struggling with comfort food eating, reach out to us because, um, you know, we deal with it all the time. We can give you some, some tools to get through it and ways to sort of turn that discomfort into real good and healthy comfort. And there's a way out of that. So it doesn't have to be this, this negative vibe that's hurting people so much. Coming up next, healthy ways to cope with grief and traumatic loss. Hint, hint, avoidance is not one of them. And when you navigate through these, these economies with people, here's, here's what happens. We want to hold their hand through it, let them know when it's time to buy, sell, reallocate, get out of Dodge. Because a lot of times when you're struck with fear, fear does two things. Number one, it can paralyze. And, and people just put their head in the sand and say, I'm just going to forget about it and hopefully it gets better. Or it causes you to make a wrong decision. And this is why we are here is to help people navigate through the political quagmire nonsense that's going on, the economic malaise and the absolute collapse that we're seeing. And when our freedoms are eroding, our political freedoms, our economic freedoms, our personal freedoms, our religious freedoms, our health freedoms, they're all tied together. But you know what doesn't need to erode with that? Our finances. Kirk Elliott, PhD.com forward slash Sherwood.
There's a lot of talk these days about human enhancement. Terms like biohacking, bioharmonizing, biosynergizing, stacking, resilience, and anti-fragility. In our clinic, the Functional Medical Institute, we've been helping people of all shapes, sizes, and backgrounds improve their quality of their physiology and maximize their lives. So, you can follow the latest fads and gimmicks and maybe find some things that work for you. Or, you can add Kingdom Fuel to your daily regimen right now. It's the simple start to a transformed life. Our unique meal shakes are balanced. Low glycemic, rich in fiber with 20 grams of clean protein, essential vitamins and minerals, healthy fats and organic fruits and vegetables. Kingdom Fuel is vegan with a complete amino acid profile. No gimmicks, just proven results. Start today at Sherwood.tv forward slash fuel. Hey there, Kevin Sorbo here. Now deep down, we know this. We're, we're more than just a brain and a body. We're a spirit, we're a soul, and we're also a physical temple. If you hit the wall when you're trying to improve one aspect of your being, it's probably because, well, other aspects are sabotaging our success. So that's why diets don't work. And frankly, why so much conventional wisdom from our so-called medical establishments falls flat. Doctors Michelle and Mark Sherwood have a very different approach. I should know because I happen to be one of their patients. They address the whole person to get to know you, your challenges, and more importantly, what your goals are. Then they offer a complete plan that addresses your unique biology and your heart. They'll help you discover what you need to experience transformation. So find out more at Sherwood.tv slash Sorbo. That's Sherwood.tv slash Sorbo, or see the link before. Now, I'm heading for a workout. You should be going for a workout, too. All right, guys. God bless. What are some healthy ways to help cope with that word called grief or traumatic loss? Well, offhand, don't be afraid to cry. You know, I think a lot of people try to repress those tears, but the... They think it's a sign of weakness. It's not. It's a sign of strength because if you can learn to cry, um, I'm not saying out of control crying, but I'm saying if you learn to cry, you can actually see things better. It actually washes your eyes out if you get my point with that. Sometimes the eyes of your heart. But I think people really can understand this thing. We were talking just briefly beforehand that exercise works it's expected when people go into a place of grief or great trauma that they might be a little depressed i mean who wouldn't be that's a sad time and you know something has happened that you don't think should have happened or somebody died perhaps before you thought the time was right maybe they're young uh, something unexpected happened of a, a violent death or something like that or you lost a job or go through a divorce depression might be a real real thing exercise is a great way to remedy that, you know, because I've read studies and studies for years, even back when I was in the police department and talking to people that were dealing with uh, trauma. You know, being a police officer is traumatic anyway, but I used to encourage people to have an exercise routine that you, you have to do that. It's not an option. To me, exercise was officer safety. I'm not talking physical safety only. I'm talking emotional and mental safety, but exercise is a better metabolizer of adrenaline than anything else is, and that can actually stop some of that stress, and it works better than antidepressant drugs. Clinically, what I've seen with patients over the years is that sometimes that traumatic loss is so paralyzing, people can't even exercise. Yeah. They can't even breathe. They have so much anxiety or so much dread that minute by minute, they can't cope. Yeah. So one of the things that we've used to help them compartmentalize so that they can continue to carry out their activities of daily living is grief is okay. Yes. In the first three months, it might be okay to have this amount of time where we're focusing on that issue and we're actually working through our emotions. We're handling the fear. We're hang handling the anger, the unforgiveness, the resentment, the disappointment, the shame, whatever is around that emotional component of loss, we have to process that. Mm. If we stuff it, it just comes up 
later, oftentimes is a wound that hasn't been resolved. So grieving and grieving openly is very important. So we set a time to do that. And with, whether it's with a counselor, whether it's with an accountability partner, it's a talk partner, somebody where they can actually talk through what's going on on the inside. Because sometimes that anxiety is just too much for them to bear alone. It is. And there's a lot of books out there and um, ideas out there about the stages of grief. But, it, you know, generally it involves like denial, uh, anger, avoidance, and maybe finally a new normal or something like that. Um, but... There is no rule book on how long it takes a person to go through those stages. There's no rule book that determines how much of those stages a person goes through. And if somebody's out there dealing with the situation right now, don't let anybody put a rule book on you. And on the same time, if you are a person that is dealing with someone who's going through that, advice would be you don't need to fix their problems. Don't tell them what they should be doing. The best thing you can do for them is just provide one of two things, ears, right, or presence, right, or both. They don't need your help. You know, they might need your presence, and your presence might be the greatest help you can give them. The worst thing to do is try to come up with saying something, you know, because it's probably going to be wrong because there's no right words. The person going through that, you know, show some empathy, sympathy, et cetera, but you, you're not them, right? So let them go through that process. And so you nailed it. The person should be allowed to go through a grief process because it's, it's right. And there's no time frame on that. Well, I found that it's very important to help them keep, stay connected. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that depression, they'll sink into a deep hole and they'll disappear. And that can lend them into unhealthy behaviors like drinking or mm -hmm. drugging or smoking or self-destructive behaviors, not even bathing. Yeah. So having somebody that keeps in contact with that person on a regular basis to do a check-in, to remind them to do the things of self-care mm -hmm. that they should do on a normal basis. And when the time is right, Right. Like you said, to move them into activity and motion so that they can stay healthy through the process. Well, I, I have a person that I've known for a long, long time that's going through a traumatic time even right now. And, and uh, when I call, the person states to me many times, I didn't even want to pick up the phone. But they also know that I'm going to keep calling until they pick up the phone. I don't take up their time, you know, because they don't want to talk. But I will say... You know, I'm just thinking about you and we'll offer, you know, if we need anything, let me know. And that's pretty much all you can do because when a person's in that place, they're stuck, man, and you've got to let them stay there. But sometimes you've got to get in that place with them is what you're saying, you know, and just, just call them and be there for them, but don't speed them up on any process. I'm also always very forthcoming and asking them if they're going to put themselves in an estate of harm. If yes. so, that's when you got to call a helpline. That's when you got to really Good. reach out. That's when you got to get them extra help so that harm doesn't come upon them. And there is the right time for medication. Sometimes totally. we need an antidepressant to bridge the gap yep. until we can get our feet on the floor to actually cope with the everyday uh, life situations that are at hand. Well, I think if you're out there and you know, you're, dealing with this, whether you're a person observing someone dealing with it or a person going through a trauma or a critical incident, uh, watch for destructive behaviors. If a person is observing destructive behaviors or a person is within the destructive behaviors, be honest about that and don't consider that a weakness. Consider that a strength because if you can be honest about that and, and talk about, you know, kind of where you are and what you're doing, that'll be better for you because many times if you deny that, uh, seeing that, you can allow someone to hurt themselves, right? And it's to not say something to someone that's like that or in that place is doing them the greatest disservice. You know, so if you're there, um, talk to somebody, work through the process and realize there's somebody out there that loves you very much. And if nothing else, we do. What does our constitution really mean? Find out next with our constitutional attorney expert, Chris Ann Hall. Let's get real. Most emergency food is just as bad for you as any other choice in the standard American diet. And that's just sad. 
We don't just need food. We need highly nutritional food. We don't just want to survive food shortages. We are meant to thrive in adversity. Complete your daily nutrition and have shelf-stable Kingdom Fuel as a cornerstone of your food supply. Don't sacrifice your health or your taste buds. Stock up on Kingdom Fuel now. And when you navigate through these, these economies with people, here's, here's what happens. We want to hold their hand through it, let them know when it's time to buy, sell, reallocate, get out of Dodge. Because a lot of times when you're struck with fear, fear does two things. Number one, it can paralyze and, and people just put their head in the sand and say, I'm just going to forget about it and hopefully it gets better. Or it causes you to make a wrong decision. And this is why we are here is to help people navigate through the political quagmire nonsense that's going on, the economic malaise and the absolute collapse that we're seeing. And when our freedoms are eroding, our political freedoms, our economic freedoms, our personal freedoms, our religious freedoms, our health freedoms, they're all tied together. But you know what doesn't need to erode with that? Our finances. Kirk Elliott, PhD.com forward slash Sherwood. We have a brand new documentary out called Noncompliant to the Sheriff. Now, our first documentary, Noncompliant, and our second documentary, Noncompliant 2, are both available at noncompliantmovie.com. The first documentary is all about the duty and the role of the state to be a check and balance on the federal government, state and local government. So if you haven't seen that yet, let me please recommend that you go to noncompliantmovie.com and watch the first documentary available to you at no cost. It is going to be life-changing and we have hundreds of thousands of five-star reviews and people all over the world sending us messages about how this message is so life-changing. And it's a global message because you know, really, it's about your inherent rights. It's about why government is designed to for one purpose the purpose is to secure your rights and how our founders put together our governments in order to retain the power by the people to be a check and balance on government through state and local government and from that we were inspired to create non-compliant to the sheriff now i have been for Oh my gosh, uh, nearly a decade traveling around the country te teaching sheriffs and deputies a three hour continuing education course all about the role and the duty of the sheriff, the history of the sheriff, the sheriff's role and duty to secure our rights, not to violate them. We have a whole section on uh, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, what our sheriffs and their deputies need to know not to be sued. And then we have a section on the jurisdiction of the sheriff, which is so incredibly important. That jurisdiction of the sheriff is really the most powerful guard and protector of the rights of the people than any other institution our founders created here in these United States of America through our constitutional republic. And it's from that course that I had sheriffs saying, telling me, this is inspirational. What you've taught us in these three hours is just simply life changing. As a matter of fact, I've taught this at big conferences where I taught the sheriffs of 17 states all at one time. And I had sheriffs coming up to me immediately before I even got off the stage saying, I've been on the phone changing policies already based on what we learned from you. And we thought to ourselves, you know what? We need the people to know this information. We need the people to know this, number one, so that they can make sure the candidates they have for sheriff know the proper role and duty of the sheriff. So we can be sure to have constitutionally minded sheriffs. Number two, because if you have a constitutional sheriff, if the body of the people are not in support of that sheriff, that sheriff cannot be 
who they want to be and who they're required to be. And number three, it empowers sheriffs who already have that inclination. In a world that is full of propaganda, like defund the police and all, all of our law enforcement is evil, you see it all over the news, you see wicked politicians propagating this stuff. We knew we had to create non-compliant to the sheriff to show people what's really happening at the level of the sheriff that the media will not show you. There are sheriffs all over America who are standing up in defiance of unconstitutional laws and orders and edicts in defense of the property rights of the people. And they've been doing this for years, but the politicians and the media do not want you to know this. They do not want you to know what sheriffs are doing successfully, regularly to stand for people's rights because this is how government's supposed to really, really work. Now, what we do with non-compliant two is we take two real life situations, two events that actually happened. A sheriff, uh, I'm sorry, a pastor who refused to shut down his church over COVID and a sheriff who arrested him for it. And a pastor who refused to shut down for COVID and a sheriff who said, I'll go to jail to keep you open. And how this two incidents actually impacted and changed their states and even all of these United States all boiled down to what a sheriff would or would not do. This film, is brand new, available at noncompliantmovie.com only right now. Uh, pretty soon we're gonna make it available on DVD. So maybe by the time you see this, it will be available on DVD at noncompliantmovie.com. But this, uh, we're already getting messages about how this is life-changing. And to be honest, if you share this with your sheriff, your sheriff might be one who has watched this movie and come back to us and asked us to come and train their deputies. Noncompliantmovie.com. It will be life-changing.